So far this week, we've talked about basic temperature regulation in the body. And we thought about the reflex arc that helps us maintain normal body temperature. Now we're going to think about what happens when we don't maintain normal body temperature, when the body core gets too hot or too cold. We call those conditions hypothermia, when the body core is below the normal temperature range, and hyperthermia, when the body temperature is higher than the normal temp temperature range. Now we're going to talk about what those conditions actually derived from, physiologically speaking. So, first of all, hypothermia, a condition in which the body core becomes cooler than normal. Body temperature falls, and the normal mechanisms that would go into place would be vasodilation of those blood vessels that supply the skin, and then shivering. But when hypothermia occurs, those normal physiologic mechanisms aren't enough, and the body cools below the normal temperature range. What sorts of conditions do you think might result in hypothermia? Maybe if you get stuck in really cold water being submerged in really cold water for sometimes even as little as one to two minutes or less can do it for sure. Anything else? Just being exposed to cold for a long period of time with wind without somewhere Ex sheltered. Exactly, without shelter, somebody who can't come inside and be sheltered from the cold exposure, those people can also experience hypothermia. When the blood is cool enough to lower the body core temperature significantly into the hypothermic range, do we see any changes in physiologic parameters? Do the vital signs change at all? Ryan, you're one, saying yes. One, one that we would see would be a decrease in temperature. Well, a decrease in temperature for sure because that's the definition of hypothermia. And then what else might go along with that? Um, we may see decreased heart rate. Yes, definitely. Anything else? Yes. Decreased respiration. Decreased respiration rate. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything else? Well, I can tell you that um, in a hypothermic condition, we would also start to see um, a fall in blood pressure because um, blood pressure mechanisms and that regulate blood pressure would start to fail if the condition was severe enough or prolonged enough. And ultimately, um, we would expect if, if the hypothermia was severe enough, a patient would, or a person would lose consciousness and um, that would obviously be very detrimental. So um, hypothermia is um, a state in which the body cools so much that the normal reflexive mechanisms that help us bring the body temperature back to normal just don't work effectively. Amanda, you maybe see this in a clinical setting. Certainly in the emergency room setting. And there are some uh, physiological conditions um, that can cause the body to not regulate its temperature well enough. Um, but uh, we do some interventions to help people rewarm. So Lydia, what's one thing you think we might do um, to help someone who's hypothermic? Well, we maybe want to keep the room in which they're staying warmer than to just try and raise their body temperature some. Right, we'll, we'll raise their body temperature. So keeping the room warm, blankets, hot water bottles, if they're awake, warm beverages. But uh, will we want to crank the room up to 80? Will we want to rewarm them quickly? No, we probably yeah. want to do it slowly. And Ryan, I saw you shaking your head. So why would we want to rewarm them slowly? You don't want to um, have a, 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 dr a dramatic increase in temperature. You want the body to um, gradually increase. Okay. To give the body time to 
uh, recuperate and not to, sh to shock the system. Um, so Dr. Skangel also mentioned that low blood pressure can be a consequence of hypothermia. Uh, Stacy, what do you think we might do to help offset that in a hypothermic patient? Um, give the patient some fluid. Right, some fluid. So if they're awake and alert, give them some oral fluid, something warm to drink. And we even give IV solutions that have been warmed as well. Uh, we'll get to you soon, Naomi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would also just, I think, like to finish the hypothermia um, portion of this lecture by saying that we can survive um, internal body temperature conditions as low as like 22 to 24 degrees C and then be gradually rewarmed to the normal body temperature range without any permanent damage to organs. And um, so hypothermia is a treatable condition as long as it's not too severe and the patient has not um, progressed too far into um, uh, an imbalance of temperature regulation. Okay, so at the other end of the continuum, we're not too cold, the other end of the continuum is too hot, hyper Thermia. And when we think about hyperthermia, there are gradations of the condition. Uh, the less severe hyperthermic condition is a condition that we commonly call heat exhaustion. Um, if you think for a minute with me about what could be going on during this experience of heat exhaustion, the basic characteristic of the condition is that the person who's experiencing heat exha exhaustion will have trouble maintaining normal circulatory pressures. So blood will not be able to circulate through the body effectively. What this results from is um, that the heat loss mechanism that is triggered by the hypothalamus is going to trigger sweating and the sweating is going to result in loss of body fluid which will then cause a loss of blood volume which will make it difficult to maintain normal blood pressure and normally if we think about somebody who was in a thermoneutral environment and they were just maintaining normal body temperature, if that person was experiencing a fall in blood pressure, the compensation that would be triggered would be to vasoconstrict peripheral blood vessels so we could bring blood back to the body core, and help to maintain blood flow to vital organs. But when someone has um, become hyperthermic, we know that normally what will be part of that increase in body core temperature is vasodilation in the periphery as a way that we can lose body heat, right? So conflicting signals, right? We've got so much heat, we want to vasodilate in the periphery blood pressure has fallen and you would think that we would vasoconstrict, but when heat exhaustion is occurring, the normal mechanisms don't work. And so what happens is the vasodilation is prolonged and it just kind of worsens that inability to maintain circulatory pressure. Um, this is actually a not uncommon situation that can occur in people who have exercised for a prolonged period of time in a hot environment. It would be very common for them to have been sweating so that they could cool the body. That sweating results in a loss of body fluids and ultimately they will be at the point where the loss of body fluids compromises their ability to maintain circulatory pressures. So what kind, of, um, what kind of symptoms might a person experience if they were suffering from heat exhaustion? 
dizziness? Yeah, they may, because they're having trouble maintaining um, proper blood flow to the brain, they can experience um, some dizziness. Um, Naomi, did you have an idea? Shortness of breath? Well, maybe we would see that. We, we, most of the effects are initially going to be um, experienced in the brain. So a person may have, um, they may get a headache, um, they may feel a little bit of dizziness. Um, I would expect that they could feel some nausea or some discomfort in their stomach. Um, what are we going to do with someone ex who's having this experience, Amanda? Um, well, uh, what do you guys think? We're, we're going to want to cool them, cool them down. Um, and as Dr. Skanga mentioned, um, Heat exhaustion is almost a, a two-fold problem. You have the heat and you have dehydration. So we want to cool these patients down and hydrate them. So if, you, if say, you're assisting at a marathon, uh, Stacy, and you see someone who who's, seems to be in distress with a headache, maybe a little dizzy, what would you, what would you do? Um, give them some fluids and have them rest for mm -hmm. a little bit to not like have them move around so that they create more heat. Um, have them sit down, give them something cool to drink, sit in the shade, mm -hmm. have them rest. Um, and uh, Naomi, what are we worried about? What are we trying to s prevent with a patient who has heat exhaustion? You're trying to prevent them from exerting themselves more and further like worsening right. their right. condition. Excellent. Exactly, because if we don't interrupt the, the um, process that's going on during heat exhaustion by starting to cool the body and rehydrating the person, the condition can very quickly progress to the next stage of hyperthermia that we call heat stroke, and that is much more severe. Basically, in heat exhaustion, the body's um, reflex loops are still working to some degree. They may not be able to correct the imbalance that is occurring, but the brain is still functioning enough that the body's heat loss mechanisms are attempting to work. In contrast, in, high, in um, a condition of heat stroke, the hyperthermia is so severe that um, the the brain is no longer able to um, implement normal feedback loops to try and correct the hyperthermia. And in fact, a positive feedback cycle is, is um, created in which the hyperthermia actually generates heat loss mechanisms that worsen the condition. And the worsened condition further exacerbates the mechanisms. And so very quickly, um, someone can progress to um, a very serious condition if we don't interrupt the hyperthermic process. So one of the first things that we would see is um, somebody who is um, experiencing heat exhaustion will be sweating, right? And so their skin will probably feel warm and moist because there will be sweat on the body's surface. But when somebody moves into a state of heat stroke, um, the skin will be hot and dry. Can you speculate why? Stacy, Is the body starting to try to compensate the, the fluid loss so it's going to try to stop sweating so that yes. it doesn't lose any yes. more? Yes, so the skin is dry because sweating has shut down, and um, when sweating shuts down, then your chances of having any heat cooling mechanism are um, pretty poor. Um, if body core temperature goes up too high, again, this is a review, but why do we worry if it goes up too high? Lydia. Well, when the temperature rises, it just interferes with the functioning of 
the enzymes which are necessary for pretty much everything. Exactly, they're necessary for everything. And so when the body temperature goes too high, what we are going to see is um, a progressive shutdown of various vital organs. And somebody who is experiencing heat stroke can have shutdown of kidneys, liver, brain, um, many of the vital organ functions. Are there any conditions, Amanda, that might predispose someone to um, being prone to having heat stroke? Well, older adults um, don't have as, as sensitive um, thermoregulation. They can't sense fluid loss, thirst, um, and heat as, as well as a younger person. Um, so o older adults are at risk for hyperthermia and also uh, very young uh, individuals, uh, neonates, newborns, and young children who also um, don't regulate fluid well and can't tell you that they're thirsty or they're too hot are also at risk for hypothermia. Did you have others? Because I'm also thinking people with cardiovascular disease yes. or peripheral vascular disease will also be at risk because they have trouble maintaining blood pressure and cardiac output um, when they're in very physiologically stressful kinds of um, conditions. Um, as are uh, pregnant women mm -hmm. and others who have, um, say someone who's in chronic kidney failure who has a uh, uh, poor regulation of fluid. And I want to emphasize, Dr. Skanga, that hyperthermia is a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. If you suspect hyperthermia, you need to look for help, call emergency services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, the you know, when you do get to the emergency department at a hospital, what will they be doing if you have heat stroke? Um, so, they, the, so there will be an emphasis on preventing organ failure. <laughs> so we do want to want to cool off the patient, but our, our emphasis would be to take care of those core organs. Mm -hmm. um, so cool IV fluids, replacing the fluid volume, and there are things like ice packs and cooling blankets and cooling protocols that are used um, in hyperthermic uh, situations, but it's, it's an emergency situation. And so the goal is to cool the body and rehydrate because um, heat stroke, if it's severe enough, truly can be fatal because of the multiple organ shutdown that's possible.